Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to this uh, Cluster Act webinar. Um, Cluster Act, I just remind you that is uh, a project financed by uh, the ASME and is uh, uh, targeted to uh, support investments uh, in the maritime sector and in particular we target countries that are member of this, uh, this project uh, and um, the activity of the webinar is designed to provide a specific uh, information to investors and to ACMEs in relation to uh, specific uh, uh, maritime fields and specific tools for enterprises. And uh, today uh, we have a, a webinar that is dedicated, it is named uh, Radius Reports and Marinas and uh, uh, we will have uh, two guests today and uh, we will deepen what are the trends uh, uh, and the market with a market inside and a technology inside related to ports and to marinas. Um, in this sense, we will have uh, a first half an hour with uh, uh, Mr. Teofanis that I'm welcoming, uh, that you can see also uh, with, on the screen, and um, dedicated to ports. And then in the second half, we will have also uh, um, a part of the webinar dedicated to uh, marinas. We will have with us uh, Mr. Antonio Saleda uh, from the um, Barcelona Cluster Nautic while uh, Mr. Sofanis is from the uh, Port Authority of uh, uh, Port of Thessaloniki in Greece. And um, I'm just, uh, uh, just thanking both uh, speakers to uh, be here with us. And um, I would just uh, uh, remind to the audience that uh, there is a possibility to send uh, questions through uh, the application. So the application GoToWebinar go to allows you to send questions that uh, we will give, try to give an answer at the end of the first uh, half, uh, so first half of the webinar that will be approximately in half an hour, and then we will do the same at the, in the second part, after the second part. So um, I will just leave the stage to Mr. Tofanis uh, and uh, um, just uh, um, also welcome all the audience that is here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the first part of this uh, webinar will be will deal with ports and uh, in particular with trends, technologies and market insight. Uh, okay, uh, dealing with the port industry is a rather vast area, uh, but uh, I will try to provide you a grasp of what is going on with the special focus on the container terminals and the container shipping uh, uh, influence on uh, container ports, but we will deal uh, in the beginning with the definitions. And the definitions will have actually to do with what type of terminals we have in the port industry. Then the second part will be uh, a market uh, structure um, and evolution in ports uh, brief of what is going on and how the shipping affects the port's evolution. Then the third part will be the backbone of the global operations in ports, which is the emergency and uh, the activity of the global terminal operators, the GTOs or ITOs, International Terminal Operators. Then the fourth is what is the impact of actually magnifying the capacity of the vessels uh, with particular reference to ultra-large container vessels, ULCBs, and how this has impacted the ports. Then the next subject of the presentation will be the challenges we do have from an energy and environmental point of view in the port industry and how this relates to the IMO 2020 regulation. Then uh, it's uh, the technology and the port of the future. What is a smart port and how we think uh, will be the port of the future? What are the main challenges getting to the port of the future? And then some conclusions. Uh, the, the definition. The definition we need to define what are the kind of uh, terminal operators. Uh, we have the container terminals, which serve actually a scheduled traffic, uh, what we call liner shipping. Then we have the general cargo and the break and break bulk cargo terminals, uh, which serve uh, general cargo 
shipments. Then we have the dry bulk and the liquid bulk terminals, different in nature. Uh, another area of terminals is those that are serving passenger packs, as we call vessels, RORO and ROPAX vessels, combination of RORO and uh, passenger vessels. Then we have a specific uh, uh, kind of terminals, which are what we call PCTC terminals, pure car, truck carrier vessel serving. And then last but not least are the cruise terminals. Today we will concentrate mainly on container terminals. Uh, then if we're going to speak about the evolution in ports, we need to understand the market structure and uh, the influence of the market structure on the evolution of ports. You can see in this slide the major uh, container routes. Uh, based uh, actually on a mapping of 2013, but uh, the situation is uh, totally the same regarding the structure of these networks. Uh, Trans-Pacific, Asia, Europe, um, Asia, Middle East, uh, Australia, Far East, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have mainliner connections, and then we'll see later on how we go down uh, to the uh, hierarchy of the ports. Uh, if we have to, to see what is going on based on 2017 data, uh, which were actually let down um, in uh, uh, answer the review of maritime transport 2018, uh, we had 10.7 billion tons yearly an annual uh, growth in 2017 of 4%. Uh, the growth in the containerized traffic was a little bit uh, uh, more, uh, uh, was 6.4%, uh, but the containerized uh, cargo accounted uh, for 17.1% of, uh, of the total traffic. Then you can see what is the anticipated uh, uh, evolution of the traffic in different parts of the world, including actually uh, the estimate for the, the year uh, 2023. Uh, as you can see, we may have an average uh, growth in Europe of 3.4%, uh, more or less the same in uh, North America, 3.6%, but uh, the major part will be actually uh, the rise of traffic in uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, with the driver mainly China, with uh, an increase of 4.9%. We don't know when we had this projection, we didn't know about the COVID-19 impact. I don't think that this will be a long-lasting impact in any case. Uh, you can see actually what is the percentage of the mainliner trades in the total global containerized traffic. 40% the east-west, 27% uh, the intra-regional, and then um, lower actually uh, contributions from uh, non-main lane east-west, south-south, and north-south. Uh, in the next slide, we can see what is the evolution of the ports. And we can uh, still we can uh, see that uh, there are four generations the ports before 2009 uh, uh, excuse me 1960 those that they were the main cargo was break bulk those that uh, there were between uh, 1960 and 1960 and 1980 with the second generation with the proliferation of break bulk traffic, and then from 1980 onwards until 2000, it's container. But after 2000, what we have is the fourth generation. And what is the characteristic of the fourth generation? Two words, two, two very important words. Technology, the inclusion of new technology in general, and we'll see later on what is the kind of technology, and then net. We do not have separate ports now. We have networks of ports and networks of 
chains of logistics chains of transportation. These are the two important words. As you can see now, uh, and we'll see later on, we have an integration of uh, traffic from origin to destination. So the marine, the port terminal, which is actually in, uh, in the middle, is the backbone of this operation, but we have three tiers. The one tier is the seaside tier, and this has to do with the overseas origin or destination, the regional hub where we have transshipment, and then the terminal per se. On the tier two, which is the proximity land side tier, we have satellite terminals and distribution centers, including last mile distribution. And then in tier three, we have the receivers of the cargo. So we do have in port logistics a tiered approach and both port operation operators to a certain extent, but mainly shipping lines are looking now on the whole supply chain and on the whole origin destination route. Uh, what are the trends in uh, global container shipping affecting uh, the ports? There are some important actually uh, uh, components. The first is the role of concentration in liner shipping with the shipping alliances. As we'll see later on, we have a very strong concentration in container, particularly shipping. Then the second thing, we have the emergence of global terminal operators. We'll see that later on a little bit. Uh, but what is the thing is the proliferation of network global entities having more than one uh, terminals strategically placed in certain regions and continents. Then the third, as I said earlier, is the role of the end-to-end -end services, which is extremely important. Then we have the evolution of the vessel capacity and the impact on port facilities. We have bigger vessels which places a, a strong actually push and challenge to the port operators to enlarge and make bigger their facilities in order to maintain the possibility of having direct mainline services. Then we have the new technologies and the automation in the port operations. And last but not least is what we think about the um, role of the port in future. Uh, so what are the recent developments in container shipping that are affecting ports? First of all, carriers are increasingly eyeing growth prospects associated with the wider uh, spectrum of rates of services, including plant side operators, operations. All of them, they want to have a foothold in the land side. Second important thing is that uh, uh, as I said, port and shipping interests are focusing attention on inland logistics, uh, which have an additional revenue generation potential, which is quite challenging at certain point. We have efforts to become, by carriers, to become freight integrators, and we have a sustained consolidation, as I said, in vertical operation in shipping. Uh, Owing to the further consolidation of the container shipping segment, the top 10 shipping lines, they had a, a market share of 68% a, a in the year 2014. Now, they, in 2019, they had around 90%. That un, under, makes us understanding what is the power, the market power of this company. And this influences the port operations and port industry as well. Uh, additionally, the capacity deployed has, ro has risen has significantly to 90, uh, 96 million 20 foot equivalent units on the three major east-west container lines. Several alliances uh, are and uh, joint ventures have been established in 2018 and 19 between terminal operators. The, uh, and oversupply of vessels 
despite the decline in fleet growth. The, um, the shipping lines have invested a lot and now they understand that they had made an uh, overinvestment and that makes them a little bit to decelerate the growth. And particularly this has been done to very large, to what we call ultra large container vessels. Those that they are above uh, 15,000 TGUs capacity. The next thing which is very important is the environmental challenges and particularly those that have been imposed by the IMO 2020 regulation. And uh, these prospects and this influence is actually in progress. So, summing up, container shipping becomes a network, gradually a network on the oriented industry, both in terms of service and port terminals. Mega carriers have been emerged with all the consequences. We have the emergence of global terminal operators. We have the consolidation mega alliances of shipping lines and the deployment of slow shipping, uh, steaming, excuse me, by shipping lines in order to uh, decrease the consumption on energy. As we are aware, possibly off. Uh, we have three alliances. Ocean Alliance, which includes China, Costco Shipping, Evergreen Line, CMHSM, and OOCL, which has been taken by Costco. Uh, we have the alliance, which is Yangming, Kappa Gloid, uh, which has acquired UASC and Ocean Network Express. This is the merger of the three Japanese companies, NYK, K-Line, and MOL. And then we have the 2M, which is actually alliance of Maersk and MSC, the two biggest uh, container lines. What is the impact of these alliances? You can see that here. Uh, the three alliances in the Asia-Europe trades hold 96% of the total traffic. And in uh, the Trans-Pacific, 94% of the total traffic. So you understand that it's very, very, uh, I would say, tiny room uh, for other players in these mainline services. Then I go to the next thing, which is how we magnify, how the industry has magnified the carrying capacity of the vessels. And what is the impact of ports? You can see that we started back 40 years ago with small container ships of 500 to 800 TGUs capacity. Uh, and now we have made to what we call new generation, which is 22,000 TGUs uh, uh, capacity uh, per vessel. Uh, you understand that this is a huge evolution uh, which puts additional challenges uh, to the, to the uh, port facilities. From a draft of 9 meters in the beginning, we went to 15.5 meters. From a beam of 17 uh, meters, we went to 59 meters. And from an LOA of around 140 meters, we went to an, a length overall of 400 meters. And that exerts a huge challenge and pressure on port operators to invest more to accommodate these vessels. Uh, in the next slide, you can see I will not get into detail because we run out of time, uh, on what is the split of the capacity breakdown by TU size in uh, last September based on alpha liner data. You can see that the 18,000 TGUs capacity and beyond vessels is around 9% of the total capacity, around 10%. And this magnifies gradually. And now we go to the next important evolution uh, and a restructuring that has happened in the past in the port industry, and which is the emergence of global terminal operators. What are the global terminal operators? These are terminal operators that they have strategically split their activities in 20, 30, 40, 50, even more terminals worldwide. And there are three kinds 
of operators. The first are uh, the global stevedores, which they, are, they had their primary focus on the terminal operate, operators and their work as profit centers. Um, and they develop in different parts of the world in order to spread the investment risk. <laughs> on the other side, we have global carriers terminal operators, like, for instance, APMT of MERSC or Costco Pacific of uh, uh, Costco uh, line. Uh, the prime focus is in container uh, shipping. What they seek to is to become cost centers and not profit centers mainly. Uh, and the greater efficiency is gained by integrating the terminal with the wider shipping uh, service network. And in the middle, we have the global international hybrids, which have the main activity is liner shipping, but terminals form a separate business unit. Uh, the additional focus is on terminal operation. We can have companies like uh, TIL, of, um, uh, where Mediterranean shipping company participates. You can see here the split between the global terminal operators and um, the, the rest of the terminal capacity and throughput based on 2016 during consultants' um, data. Uh, from here, you can see that 43% uh, of the total traffic uh, stands with um, the global terminal operators of the total global uh, traffic, and 57% is with the others. Now, what is the impact of magnifying the capacity of the vessels? The impact is uh, that we get to what we call a port hierarchy. What does it mean? It means that the big vessels, they go to big uh, hubs, uh, which are pure transshipment hubs. They do transshipment there, for instance, Joya Tower or Marsax Lock or many other hubs like that. Uh, and then from there, through uh, subtle feeder services or cycle feeder services, uh, they get to feeder ports and they may serve other ports close to the hub that they share both a, a, a gateway function that means they can serve a bigger um, area of influence uh, than uh, the feeder ports but also they can serve these uh, feeder services purely feeder ports. I will not get into more details that, on that. Uh, so we have, uh, as I said, the case where the ULCVs have changed the port hierarchy. So we have fewer port calls of the main line of services. And then we have uh, <coughs> transshipment hubs, which is the second part. We have gateway ports, which serve as an extended, potentially non-captive, serve an extended, excuse me, potentially non-captive hinterland, uh, and we have purely feeder ports which serve their captive hinterland. Then, let's go to the environmental and energy challenges in ports. What are the real uh, energy conservation and energy sources in ports, and how ports try actually to save energy consumption and at the same time protect to a certain extent the environment through minimizing uh, the energy consumption emissions. We have the energy management plans. All serious terminals now they do, they have developed and they do apply more or less strictly energy management plan which means precise recording of energy consumption from each operational step and type of equipment. Then power management in equipment, that means that they try to minimize uh, the, uh, the uh, not only minimize, but also um, 
take the best use of the uh, the best uh, outcome of the use of equipment through a power management schedule then we have the case of energy storage technology and reusing equipment and then we have the use of micro grids to store energy a very important thing is the need of reducing the carbon footprint in uh, in the issue of minimizing the global warming effect we have the use of alternative energy sources where possible we have gradually the implementation of lng liquefied natural gas both in landside and marine operators through for instance hybrid lng diesel terminal tractors or dual fuel marine agents we have equipment electrification we have in certain areas but not uh, i would say very broadly yet applied what we call onshore power supply no ops we call that in the united states called ironing there are still challenges with that that gradually they have been addressed and we have also the carbon footprint management plan which goes side to side with uh, the energy management plan uh, lng bunkering in uh, ports just to have a word on that three ways ship to ship track to ship or short to ship not yet very much applied and this has to do with the fact that there are very very few uh, vessels yet that they have the ability of deploying lng as fuel we have some safety chances with fixed banking installations but in europe the major ports what we call the 10 t core ports by the end of the year 2025 should provide bunkering facilities then we we'll go to the next part, which is the agenda of the port of the future. What are the smart port technologies and how we can use the technology? We can use the technology in infrastructure monitoring. We can use the technology in handling operations and automation monitoring control. We can look after and control and monitor the whole intermodal traffic chain we can use smart technologies in safety and security in energy and environment particularly in monitoring as i said earlier and in customs clearance all major technologies like uh, big data and internet of things and artificial intelligence can be used in the port operations and the port operations is not the first part to be used but is uh, the first sector to be used but is one of the most promising in having effect of the application as well as one of the most challenging and you know why because uh, it's very easy as I, uh, as they say to make to automate the, the process but you cannot make that to excuse me to make the processes uh, automated but you cannot make them autonomous that means that the human brain and the human mind and the human decision making will be present in any case even when you apply uh, uh, very advanced uh, uh, technologies uh, as i said regarding the application of technology there are four challenges the real question remains what the port wants to achieve by becoming smart why we do deploy new technologies so that means what is the strategic imperative <laughs> why we do automate port processes like container handling or intraterminal um container intraterminal movement or uh, container storage in the storage yard. The second one, we need to increase the focus on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a very important thing. One of the, the biggest shipping line in the past two years had a very serious uh, problem of cybersecurity that really influenced negatively 
their operation. The third is the need for cooperation between the ports and terminals in order to truly share data and insights, which is still unexplored to a very major extent because of issues that relate also with credibility of data exchange between players. And the fourth is the role that the port authority can share within a smart port strategy as a, 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 neutral, uh, a neutral platform uh, for the development and facilitation of this smart port strategy for its users. We had in the uh, in Mediterranean, in Greece, an example of uh, developing by a terminal a port community system in, in um, the past year and trying to apply that in the last uh, month, where there were strong opposition by the end users and other stakeholders. The reason was that they were not sure that there will be actually uh, uh, a case where their data will be fully secure. And the uh, experience, the global experience says us that we need to be very, very conscious when we apply such, uh, such uh, data sharing platforms like the port community systems. The last but not least uh, thing in this one is how much automation has actually penetrated our uh, industry? Uh, based on Drury Maritime Research data of last year, 2019, only 1% of the container terminals worldwide are fully automated, and 2% are semi-automated. 97% are not automated. You know why? Not because technology is not there, but the complexity of the port operators make extremely challenging to have an autonomous, non-controlled process. And my personal opinion, I would say, based on my 30, 30 years or more experience in the port industry, is that in, in future we are going to have a much higher degree of semi-automation, but very, very low degree of full automation. I have put also another slide, which is the existing and the plan automated container test terminal spread. There will be actually in future much more automation incorporated in terminal operations, but in a way that the human element and the human brain will be a decision, a very important decision element, particularly when we have exemption management. When something comes out, which is not fully prescribed in the normal process. Uh, conclusions. We have dramatic changes in the port sector during the last 20 years. We have changes in function, in hierarchy, in logistic concepts, in IT technology, in handling technology and automation. We have the emergence of the global terminal operators, which was, and it is still, a very strong game changer. We have the increase in size of vessels which challenges the port industry in terms of infrastructure and equipment, shipment sizes and handling of container flow, and streamlining containers in hinterland. We have a serious, in certain particular <coughs> shipment hub, new era of congestion. Ports try to alleviate that, but still, in certain areas, it's a challenge. Then we have an increase of environmental awareness and the need to reduce the carbon footprint, which puts talents in the port industry. We have an energy reduction, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, an energy consumption reduction process, which is another challenge, but has made the port industry to take certain steps in, in this direction. We have the LNG that becomes gradually standard marine fuel, which leads to LNG bunkering uh, infrastructure development needs. And we have technologies uh, like the onshore 
uh, power supply, OPS, the cold iron, that are attractive in principle. They have made a great pro progress in the last 10 years. I remember when I was back in the United States, in New Jersey, uh, New York and New Jersey, 10 years ago, this technology was really in a very, very difficult primary phase. Now things have major challenges have been addressed, but still this kind of technologies need to prove their applicability. And I think that uh, with this uh, last uh, slide, uh, I terminate uh, my presentation. Okay, good afternoon and uh, I'm back and thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was really uh, dense and concrete in terms of uh, um, a lot of uh, insights related to ports. Uh, maybe uh, just instead we, we wait uh, if we do have any question from from the audience. I can just uh, a brief question to you. Just uh, uh, if you just uh, could um, uh, comment with uh, um, what could be a technology that uh, is strategic for that could be really interesting for investors that want to invest in ports right now. Just among the, the whole technology that we see. It's interesting. Uh, in Thessaloniki port, we try now to establish, um, to establish an innovation hub, a very focused innovation hub on ports, trade, transport, and logistics. You know why? There are many, many areas where, okay, the big companies of IT are integrators, but startups can really contribute. And at least on the soft side of technology ad adoption, my, my experience both, both from the port per se and the port industry, as well as from my university, because as you saw, I have a second, um, a second identity being a senior fe fellow in the past. I was professor uh, of port operations in, uh, in New Jersey. My, my feeling is that they, there is a strong ground for small startups and IT technology uh, companies to get into this area. This is number one. Number two, the whole integration of from origin to destination of the <coughs> supply chain provides many, many opportunities for small enterprises to be actually in this, uh, I would call it network puzzle by providing specific oriented uh, secondary services. Uh, secondary may be not the appropriate word, but there is a huge opportunity to provide uh, services to integrators that the integrators are not focusing on or they do not spend their resources to them. I think that these two areas, um, the, the, the issue of smaller companies in the technology sector, broadly speaking, and the professional services and products in the overall supply chain by specialized needs market service providers are the two areas where SMEs can have a very good prospect. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for this, uh, for this answer. And uh, now I think we can, um, we can just move to the um, to the other uh, other part of the webinar that will be dedicated to the marinas. So um, actually, um, I will just thank you, Mr. Tofanis, one more for uh, for uh, the, the contribution. And uh, in case we we can also collect any question um, from the audience, and then we can also reach to you if there is any curiosity that might uh, might uh, uh, emerge from the from the audience. You are more than glad to share my, my email and also through you to collect any question. I'm more than glad to answer. 